Hi, in today's video we're going to be talking about wire and specifically we're going to be talking about Newtone IW3 intercom wire. IW3 is the original Newtone intercom wire. It originally came out with the very first Newtone intercom back in 1957 and that was for the model 2011 slash 2012 and IW3 wire was used in all Newtone 3 wire systems all the way up through the end of 2008. So it's a widely used wire and in that amount of time it went through some changes in its appearance although technically it's all identical and it's all interchangeable. So today we're going to look at the different types of IW3 that were made and then I'm going to show you how to splice and extend wires when you need to do that. So here we have three examples of Newtone IW3. This is the original IW3 and it's a, all IW3 is a flat parallel three conductor cable. So there are three individual wires in an IW3 and then they're bonded together in a parallel configuration which means that the outside edge wire is always on the outside edge as is the other outside edge wire and the one in the center is always in the center and no matter how you run this or what you do to it you can run it up walls across ceilings you can run it through studs you can twist it up like this it doesn't make any difference because it is always parallel wires they're never twisted pair wires, which is a different type of Newtone wire. They're, it's always a flat parallel cable. The other thing to know about Newtone IW3 or flat parallel cable wire is most of the early Newtone intercom systems rely heavily on the flat parallel wire design and if you use other types of wires if you substitute in telephone wire or cat5 wire or something like that you'll affect how the system operates and you may end up with a system that doesn't operate correctly at all and that is more true the further back you go in time so the original Newtone systems in the late 50s through the early 70s were very wire dependent systems that became less true starting around 1994 when the IM 3303 was introduced but as you go backwards you go to the 3003 and the 2003 and then prior to that you have the 303 and 313s they are more and more wire dependent so it's never a good idea to intermix different types of wires since all of those systems are now long discontinued models you wouldn't be installing a new one anyway but you certainly if you're moving or extending lines you don't want to intermix different types of wires into the system you know sure if you're only adding on 12 inches of wire it's not really a big deal but if you're adding hundreds of feet of wire into a system then intermixing is a bad idea fortunately there's a lot of Newtone IW3 left floating around in the world Newtone no longer manufactures this but there's always a lot available if you look online so coming up with some shouldn't really be a problem this is an early piece of IW3 and you can see here that it's the flat parallel three conductor cable and the insulation on it is all gray. If you flip it over on either side it's just gray insulated wire that's bonded together. In those days when this was made and this is an original piece it probably is from the middle 60s when an installer would go to hook this up he would have to know how to identify which strand is which at each end because this end might be at a bedroom station but the other end is behind the master station and you have to hook up the correct conductor at the same terminals on each end. So the way that's done is not by the color of the insulated jacket but by the color of the actual wire. So I'm going to show you how that looks. First thing we need to do is strip off the insulation off the ends of the wire so we can see the actual metal wire inside the cable. So there's a couple different ways to do that. You can use your trusty electrician side cutters like these and you normally when you strip back wire like this you're looking to strip back about three quarters of an inch and you carefully 
bite the insulation and pull it off like this. So here we have a bare conductor. That's okay to do and for those of us who do this every day you get pretty adept at closing the jaws of your cutters just the right amount so you don't nick the metal wire. One of the downsides to this is if you do happen to nick the wire while you pull the insulation off when you bend and twist and wrap the wire it may snap off where it was nicked and then you'll lose the connection that might happen right when you're hooking the wire up or it might happen two weeks later after you've already put the speaker in the wall and then you have a non-operational station and you're not sure why so another way to go is to use this type of wire stripper this has two jaws and it has indentions in each jaw that are specifically for different sizes of wire and these are commonly available you can buy them online or you can buy them at the your local hardware store or home improvement center it has different wire gauges marked on the jaws you have 16 18 20 22 24 and 26 and the idea of this kind of wire stripper is that you choose the correct indention to match the size of the wire. All Newtone intercom wire is 22 gauge wire. So you would simply place one of the conductors in the indention for 22, which is this one. And when you close it, the circular cutouts in the jaws only close far enough to cut through the insulation and you pull it off and it eliminates the possibility that you might nick the wire which could break off later on. These are good especially if you're not used to stripping wires in the first place. If you buy a pair of these they'll last you a lifetime. They also come in different sizes. This one only goes up to as large as 16 gauge. They make other models that are good for more general purpose electrical work which will cut 12 and 14 gauge wire and insulation so if you are working with house wiring you can get one for that too so we'll go ahead and strip off the last one and then we'll take a look at the actual wire all right so now we've stripped back our insulation and we have our three bare conductors let's take a look at these and i'll show you how you determine which is which at which end so here we're looking at the three stripped ends of our IW3 and you'll notice something interesting if you look closely. This conductor here on this edge of the wire is silver colored and this one and this one are copper. This was done intentionally to help you index the cable when you went to trim out a system after you had wired for it. And if you look on the early Newtone intercom systems, and actually all Newtone three wire systems use this color coding throughout the life of IW3, it would be marked on the stations and at the master station as silver, center, and copper. And the reason you can get away with doing it that way is the silver wire is obviously silver, and the center wire in a flat three-conductor three parallel cable is always in the center, which we talked about at the beginning of the video. So the center is always the center. So you have silver, center, and copper. And copper is the other edge. And this is how you would index the cable when you hooked it up to make sure you got the connections made the same at both ends of the cable. So this is how, in the early days, installers could tell which wire they were hooking up. Later on, the IW3 wire changed, so let's go ahead and look at the next version of it. So here we have a later piece of Newtone IW3. This would be from the early, or no, it's probably from the mid-70s, and it's still essentially the same. It's still your basic flat three conductor parallel cable. It has the same con size conductor in it. It's still a 22 gauge wire. The insulation is perhaps a little heavier than it was on the original wire, but the primary difference is now Newtone has added some color coding to the cable and you have on one edge a blue stripe, on the other edge there's a red stripe, and of course the conductor in the middle of the cable is always in the middle of the cable as we talked about no matter what you do to twist it or turn it or wrap it around something the center wire is always the center wire. Newtone added the color coding to the to the insulating jacket to help make it easier for 
people to install their own systems or for installers to install the systems and you had a red stripe and a blue stripe so when indexing the wires it was easy to do and even though they did that the conductors inside the cable still followed the silver center and copper color coding that they did on the original IW3. So they didn't abandon the colors of conductors as a way to index it. They just simply added the red stripe and the blue stripe to the jacket. And you can see here in the close-up the red stripe, the center wire again is always in the center and the blue stripe and starting with the systems that were made in the mid 1970s on the connections on the back of remote stations and connections on the master station it would then be labeled instead of being just silver center and copper they would now say red slash silver center is always just center and then blue slash copper so they added the color coding to the terminal names so it was easier for people to hook up the wires so this is the middle type of IW3 now let's go ahead and look at the last type so here we have the last type of Newtone IW3 that was made and perhaps I should turn it over this way but you can't see the color coding as well this is IW3 from the 1990s and the primary difference you'll see when you hold it up against the previous style is that it appears dimensionally smaller it's not as heavy and even though it appears that way the conductor size inside the cable it's still all 22 gauge wire they simply have reduced and made the insulating jacket on the outside of the cable thinner I, I would assume that it was either a change in the materials that the insulation was made out of or it was simply a cost saving measure but if you look on it carefully you'll see here that you still have a red stripe here and of course again the center wire is always in the center and then a blue stripe here so they continued on with the color coding as they had in, in the past and if you look here where I've separated the three strands you can easily see the red the center and the blue now if we strip this back and I'm going to break my suggestion and I'm going to use my wire cutters because that's what I'm used to doing we find a difference when we strip it back here we have red center and blue but gone is the silver wire they've eliminated the step to coat the copper wire with whatever the silver material is that makes it that color and now we simply have three copper conductors so we have red with a copper wire inside center was always copper and of course it's always center and then blue is still a copper wire so the silver wire is gone and we're relying entirely on red center and blue when we hook things up I believe that the screw terminals on the station still say red slash silver however the wire isn't made that way so this is something to be aware of if you were using some of this wire on a really early system where red wasn't an indicator you have to actually know that red and silver are the same conductors and I think it was probably also indicated in the written instructions that came with systems so I don't think it was that big of a deal now I'm going to show you the proper way to splice and extend IW3 wire how we do it when we go to someone's home one of the real popular trends nowadays when people remodel their kitchens and kitchens are the most common place to find Newtone master stations when people remodel their kitchens nowadays they have this compulsion or need to flip-flop their kitchens around wherever the stove was it's going to end up on the opposite side of the room as will the refrigerator and so forth and in many cases the master station was mounted on a wall near a desk in the kitchen and the desk is a long gone idea it'll be necessary to move the master station sometimes all the way across the kitchen or I've had jobs where I've moved master stations 40 and 50 feet from where they originally were installed and when you do that most of the time you'll find that the wiring to the master station is much much too short and these are jobs that involve not only relocating 
the master station physically, but all of the wires have to be extended and then rerouted through the walls or ceilings or sometimes under the house to take them up to the new location. And when you do that, you have to do it properly. Otherwise, you'll find at the end of the job, the system won't work correctly. Or if you make poor, poor splices and you don't do it properly, down the road from moisture and other problems, you'll start to get intermittent connections and then your system won't work right. One of our rules is that when we splice and extend wires, we never, ever, ever seal up the splices inside a wall or a ceiling where they can't be accessed. You always need to find a location that you can get access to later on. Sometimes you have to put a cut in electrical box and have the contractor cut out a plate in the back of the cabinet where you can put a cover over it to get to it or you can put it in a ceiling above a recessed light can which could be partially disassembled to get to it but you need to make an attempt if you say if you seal up spliced wires inside a wall or ceiling you're just asking fate to slap you in the back of the head later on because there's bound to be a problem and you won't be able to get to it so I'm going to show you how we do it and the way we do it helps minimize the possibilities of problems although we still don't seal things up in the walls for this example we're going to use our intermediate IW3 and let's say we're working on a remodel of a house that was done in 1979 and it's ready for a remodel and we have to extend eight or nine IW3 wires across the kitchen and to do that we have to splice onto the original wires and we're going to use some of our 1990s IW3 because that's plentiful and we have lots of it. So the correct way to do this is a combination of mechanical connection and soldering. And soldering is one of those kind of things that a lot of people don't really do, but to do this properly, soldering is really necessary. So we're going to take our two cables and we've cut back the individual conductors of the IW3 to make three individual strands. The best way to do this in most cases, and I've seen a lot of people do it a lot of different ways, the best way I like to do it is you use a pair of sharp scissors. I've seen people do it with the blades on a utility or sheetrock knife. I see electricians doing it with side cutters like this. And the problem with some of those methods is when you, when you cut this apart, you need to make sure that the insulation isn't cut on the side where you need to have it covered because then the conductor inside the wire is exposed and you could get a potential short circuit and then your intercom won't work correctly. So the way I like to do it is I take the IW3 and first I pull it through my fingers to straighten it out so it's flat and the conductors are straight and that simply makes the cutting easier. You take the scissors and you very carefully cut between the strands where the insulation is thinnest and normally if you're going to do this on a job you want to cut it back about two, two and a half inches so you have enough to work with. There's no reason to cut it back an inch and struggle through the whole thing. You're not shortening the length of the wire. You're just making the, each individual strand easier to work with. One of the things that you can also do on some of this cable is once you get it cut, you can also pull it and it'll sort of pull apart. Uh, that's true, more true on the older wire than it is on the newer wire with the thinner insulation. When you do that on this sometimes, it will tear the insulation and you end up with bare wire down here where you don't want it. So that's the way I've always done it and it seems to work pretty well. So once you separated your strands and you've stripped off the ends, and in this case, these are stripped back almost an inch. These are a little less, so I'm going to go ahead and make these an inch also because that will make it easier. Oh look, I'm using the proper wire strippers this time. All right, so I've stripped those back. So we have about a bare end on each one. We have plenty of length on our individual strands. And now what we need to do is we need to pair it up with our new wire color for color. So red goes to red, 
Again, center, which is always center, goes to center, and blue goes to blue. If you don't have a red stripe, it would be silver to red and so forth, but you have to just follow the color coding. And I will put the color coding in the video description down below so it's there for you to see. The way I like to do this is I place the new wire over the top of the old wire and when I match up the bare conductors I don't match up the ends of them because this one obviously is stripped lo back longer than the other one is I match them up where the insulation begins right here and once you've done that and I'll show you why it doesn't make any difference at the end so when you match up the insulation then what you do is you fold one over the top of the other and you very carefully just twist them together. And you don't need to use needle nose pliers, you don't need to make a big deal out of it, you just simply twist it together. So there's the first one that would be the red and red or red and silver depending on the age of the wire. Again we'll do the, the center ones, we're going to match up the point where the insulation starts on the wire, we're going to wrap it and twist it again and there's the center one and now we'll do the blue or what would be blue and copper sometimes and we'll go ahead and twist these together and now we have three nicely twisted pairs of wires. The twists are nice and even, they're nice and tight, they're not all chunky and, 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 and bulging out, it's just nicely done, good workmanship, always counts for a lot. So now that we've twisted them together, we're going to solder them th together. And the reason that you solder them is when you twist wires together like this by hand and you close and you put it inside a wall or more specifically sometimes inside an attic space where you have humidity and dirt and things like that, the wires are, while they are twisted tightly together, they're not sealed together. So there are places where moisture can get in here. And when I say moisture, I'm not talking about you have a leak in your roof and it rains on the, on the twisted wires. It's just basically from humidity in the air. Some parts of the country, the humidity is a lot worse than where we are. And with humidity and so forth, on the copper, the copper will start to turn dark and if there's a lot of humidity it'll start to turn green and you've seen that if you live in places where you have copper gutters or copper on the outsides of buildings it turns green as it gets older and the green is oxidation and the oxidation prevents it from making a good connection between the two strands of wire and that's when you get intermittent or noisy connections. You'll get static or intermittent connections from all of that. When you solder wires together, you're bonding the two wires together with another type of metal and it locks out the moisture and you have a solid sealed connection. So that's what we're going to do. So let me show you the easiest way to do that. So of course, if I'm here I am sitting in the shop and I'm showing you how to do this and I have my Heiko soldering iron, which I use every single day to repair people's intercom systems, and this would be an obvious choice on what to use. However, if you're in the middle of a remodel and you're on the ladder in the lady's kitchen, you don't have something like this with you, and you wouldn't take this with you. It's not the right tool for the job. There's a couple ways you can go. You can buy an inexpensive plug-in single wattage soldering iron, which would be fine because you're using it for field work. You're not going to be using it that often. However, instead of that, because then you have to have a cord, you have to find an outlet to plug into, and you have to drag it all around with you, what I prefer is something like this. This is my Weller Pyro Pen, and a Pyro Pen is a propane powered soldering iron and this is probably the third or fourth one I've had in almost 30 years because you take them out in the field with you they have a hard life and sometimes they get dropped or sometimes they get stepped on or sometimes people steal them so this is a Weller Pyropren model WSTA6 this is sort of a medium price ones they make more expensive ones this seemed to be a good enough choice and it simply has a propane reservoir here which you can fill on the end. The thing I really like about this is this is completely portable. There's no cord or anything like that so while you're standing on the at, on the ladder in the ladies kitchen to solder the, solder the wire, wires it's great 
but if you have to crawl under her house or climb through her attic, you can take it with you and you don't have to drag a cord behind you. So it's very portable and that works out really well. I used this recently on a service call. I was soldering some wires that went up a 150 foot driveway from a gate speaker to the lady's house and there were four or five junction points along the way and I simply could walk up the driveway, take the cover off the junction boxes, re-solder the wires, close it back up and continue and I didn't have to stretch out 150 feet of electrical cord to do that. So this is a very handy th thing if you're going to use it all the time. So to use this it's pretty simple. We're just going to turn it on by pushing this up and you can actually hear the propane coming out of the tip and we'll wait a couple seconds. This one you leave it on for a few seconds as it begins to heat and then I turn it off and I turn it back on again and actually you won't be able to see it but right in here you can see the flame and it starts to glow red and we have to wait for it to heat up a little bit while we wait for it to heat up we'll talk about solder so this is just your basic rosin core 3070 solder this is solder for soldering electronics or wires this is not the same kind of solder that plumbers use to solder copper pipes and the copper pipe type of solder is not the right kind of solder for what we're doing you need rosin core solder like this so I think our weller is hot now and the easiest way to tell that is you simply can touch the solder on the tip and you can see the smoke and it's nice and hot so we'll wipe that off oh as a tip when you're soldering the rosin in the solder burns and that's what the smoke is and that's what it's supposed to do the rosin cleans the imp imperfections off the surface of the copper so the solder will stick to it and as you do that you'll get this black buildup on the tip and it's the remains of the burnt up rosin and it doesn't conduct heat well so if you're doing a lot of soldering what you can do simply is take a rag and dampen it a little bit and then as the build up on the tip happens you just take it and wipe the tip on the wet part of the rag and it'll wipe it away and it'll be shiny again so let me go ahead and show you how to solder the wires so here we have our three twisted pair of wires and I just have, have them held down to the workbench with my, my wire cutters and all you really have to do is you touch the tip to the wire and since it's a fair amount of copper to heat up you have to hold it for a second and oftentimes if you dab just a little bit of solder it will help conduct the heat better and you simply solder it together it's that simple there's one and there's two and there's three and that's all there is to it what did that take that took like 30 seconds to do that but now these wires are permanently connected moisture and oxidation is not going to happen inside the wire and you're not going to have any loose connections so now what we need to do is we need to cover up the bare ends because you never leave bare ends you don't want short circuits to cover up the bare ends we're going to use these these are little plastic coated crimp connectors and in the business we refer to these as bean connectors and they're made by companies like Dolphin makes them and I think there's other companies also Dolphin are the more expensive ones but they're all pretty much the same and I will put links in the description down below of where you can get these from these are very very handy and those of us in the low voltage world low voltage wiring world we rely on these heavily these are very inexpensive and they come in very handy the nice thing about these are inside where you really can't see there's a metal sleeve inside and inside the metal sleeve are series of little teeth so when you insert the wires into the opening and you close them the teeth sort of bite into the copper wire to hold them in place and that way they don't fall off the other thing that's kind of nice about these is on this end there's a little round opening in the plastic covering inside is the metal 
body part of the connector and the reason they make them this way is for those of us who have to test wires it's a place where we can put our multimeter probe to measure the wire without having to take the cover off because that just makes it so much easier. These are also often sold in the white ones are usually the plain ones and then you'll see lots of companies they make ones that are colored blue and the blue ones have sort of a silicone sealant inside of it uh, to help prevent moisture and stuff like that if you're doing work on wires that are outside like the wires going up the ladies driveway we would use blue ones there because they're, they're outdoors and they have a better chance of having heavier moisture if you're doing this inside somebody's wall or attic or something like that you don't really need the blue ones the thing I don't like about the blue ones is if you have to take them off then the wire is going to have silicone residue left all over it and it's kind of smeary and sticky and you don't really need that so uh, this is one of those times where people well I'll buy the silicone ones because there must be better because they have silicone and it has a sealant in it it's not always better it's just different right tool right application that's all you got to worry about buy the white ones they're fine so how are we going to do this well these are ultimately going to go over the ends of the wires like this but one of the things I like to do before I put these on is if you remember when we twisted the wires together we paired up the the area where the insulation began on the wire so at this end it's even but I think on all three of them there was at least one copper wire that was longer than the other one and since I like things to be even what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the end off and I do this most all the time is you just snip off the end a little bit so you have a nice uniform length on all three. I'm always all about things being uniform and so what you want to end up with is about three quarters of an inch of exposed wire that's been soldered with a nice clipped off end so you don't have one wire sticking out longer than the other one. And once you've done that all you have to do is put these over the ends to cover them up and then you have to crimp them closed. Now, some guys will use a pair of pliers to squeeze them closed or something like that. All I do is I take my diagonal cutters and I just simply squeeze them in three spots. And with the little teeth inside, they're not gonna go anywhere. They're not gonna fall off and that's really all you have to do. The other advantage to doing it this way, and trust me, these are not gonna come off. I'm pulling on this really, really, really hard, and they're not gonna come off. The other advantage to doing this this way is, if one day you need to take one off, you can use a pair of small or medium-sized needle nose pliers, or regular pliers probably work fine too, and you can put them on the sides like this and if you squeeze it a little bit and then you go up here and do it again and you squeeze it a little bit it will open itself up and you can take it off take it off like that and this way you know the connector you're not going to use this again you're going to throw this away when you get done and put a new one back on and that's fine because these don't cost very much but you don't have to cut the wire off and then strip it back again and then test the wire and then solder it back together and do all that you can just simply uncrimp the bean connector do your work put a new one back on like that crimp it closed three times and you're done it's pretty easy. Now, you would think that you're all done at this point, but not quite. Because remember, this is going to be in the lady's attic, and you have to make sure that the wires don't get pulled apart. So the easiest way to do that is to tape them together. And when I say pulled apart, here's what can happen. So they're in an attic, and if you left them like this, and you have to imagine that here we have one, but you might have nine 
or you might have 18 and it's a big bunch of wires or it's in a wall somewhere or something like that. So if it's in an attic or in a wall or wherever it is, if somebody pulls on it, if somebody's walking through the attic and they happen to catch their boot on it as they're walking around trying to not step through the lady's ceiling and they pull on it, they might pull it apart. So a wire could break. So the more you do to cover the work that you do, the less problems you're likely to have. So let me show you how we do it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use some electrical tape. And this is just your standard garden variety vinyl electrical tape that you can buy almost anywhere. This particular roll has been here for a long time because I don't use a lot of electrical tape at the shop and the um, adhesive is a little dry. So if you have a fresh roll, it's better, but this will show you how to do it. So what I do is, when we get to this point, this is where we've twisted them, we've soldered them, and we've put caps on them or bean connectors on them. What I like to do at this point is, you sort of bundle them together so they're smaller, and then I go back here about a thumb's width and I fold it back on itself like this. So now we've folded it back on itself. And then I take the electrical tape and I start here on the center of the bean connector and I simply wrap it around it. And when you wrap things with electrical tape, it's somewhat stretchy. So what you do is as you wrap it, you kind of pull it and wrap it and then it sort of pulls back on itself. It wants to return to its original size so it holds on tightly. All right. So now what we've done is we've folded back the three wires on itself and we've wrapped them with electrical tape. You always start at this end and work towards this end so that way if for some reason it would Un begin to unwrap. It doesn't unwrap where the bean connectors are and it wraps here on the fold which doesn't matter as much. Now we have a bundle and if someone were to come along and pull on it or something like that, you're pulling on the bundle of wires. You're not pulling on the spliced connection so it's less likely to come apart. If you're in an attic and you have six, eight, nine, or 18 of these, what you can do is you can take three or four of them and put them together and then you can tape those into a bundle. And that way it has more strength as a group than it does individually. It is true that when you do it this way, you do end up with kind of a knot of wires wherever these are all located. But since they're in an attic or in the wall or under the floor or wherever they are, it doesn't really make any difference because nobody's going to see them when the remodel is done. I know that when the walls are opened up and they're hanging in the wall, it kind of looks like a mess. But it's not. It's practical to do it that way because it's not going to come apart. It's not going to be a problem later on. And remember, if you put these in a wall or a ceiling, you should be able to have access to them. So that's sort of the ins and outs of the history and specific changes with Newtone IW3 wire. It's a proper way to splice and extend wires if you're moving a master station or moving a remote station. And this is true not just for extending wires in a master station. It's also true if you're moving a bedroom speaker down the wall and you have to add six feet of wire. It doesn't matter how much wire you're adding. If you're adding a foot or you're adding a hundred feet, you still should do it this way so you don't have problems later on. So I hope you found this interesting and helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is ad-free as is this video. So if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel, we would appreciate it. Subscribing to our channel raises our search rankings on YouTube so more people will find our videos. If you have any comments or questions, leave them down in the comments down below. That's all for today. See you on the next video.